All right, I know we just met, but I'm gonna ask you to trust me. So close your eyes and imagine you're taking a walk through your neighborhood. Think about what you smell, what you see, what you hear. Maybe you're able to walk to a farmer's market. Maybe you're able to walk to a community garden. Now imagine you're walking back to your house, keeping those eyes closed. You arrive at your mailbox. Open the mailbox, pull out a letter. Look at that letter and read the zip code. Now open your eyes. That zip code can tell you more about your environmental quality than you ever thought. That zip code can be an indicator of your soil, air, water, even the quality of the plants that might be locally grown. In fact, we live in a time where pollution right now is one of the global causes of premature death and disease. In the context of human health, your zip code can be more important than your genetic code. I'm going to let that sink in a little longer. Your zip code is more important than your genetic code. There are places where we've measured contaminants at concentrations that are known to cause harm. There are places that have been called fence line communities or sacrifice zones. We live in a time where we have sacrifice zones. These are places where the pollution and the concentrations are elevated. And these are unjust. And we need to right these wrongs. When we think about environmental health, we need to be solving and, and creating, understanding these environmental health risks within social, cultural, and political contexts, these contexts that are perpetuating these injustices. We also need to be thinking about the social, cultural, and political strengths that exist within communities to design solutions. So what are ways that we can address this zip code issue? Well, one thing is we can have more people involved in the scientific discipline. But I'm not talking about more PhDs and lab coats. What I'm talking about is more people. And so I am the daughter of an engineer who actually, when I was a teenager, had me <laughs> rebuild um, actually rewire, technically, rewire a landline phone that I had broken when I was a teenager, because I had a lot to say, you know? <laughs> but interestingly, no, going back to my dad. So my dad spent time as a miner. He spent time building public health infrastructures in the U.S.-Mexico border region, right? This symbolic boundary reminding us of the 1983 La Paz Agreement to protect, conserve, and improve the environment. And so I bared witness to social and environmental degradation, challenges. I bared witness to social and environmental strengths, resiliencies. I grew up around family members and community experts who didn't hold former degrees, but were able to rebuild an engine, build a house, deconstruct and reassemble an ultrasound unit. These were individuals with expertise, but didn't necessarily have a formal degree. So it's easy for me to think about and reconsider who generates knowledge and who should be part of that to conversation. Because the traditional model right now is what we say is one directional. A researcher decides what to study. A researcher will decide where that study should take place. And a researcher by themselves will assign meaning to that data. On top of that, that data set might not ever get reported back or get back into the hands of those who need it, the community members who might have raised the concern or the original issue. Who are the experts in these particular zip codes? Is it the researcher or is it the community member? Well, it's the community member, right? As the scholar says, community members are experts in their own right. I remember my first job engaging community members and in, in doing community-based work and meeting people where they are who live near resource extraction and mining sites. I was hired on as a research translation coordinator, and my job was to be this knowledge broker, right, between the science being generated and the stakeholders, the government agencies and the community members. 
the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency was hosting a community meeting to announce a site that had been just been listed for cleanup, and they were going to talk about the next steps. So I went to this meeting, and I sat in the back, and I had my notebook, right? I was taking notes. I was writing everything down. I was writing down the questions that community members were raising in this space. They were asking questions about soil quality and being able to consume locally grown foods. After the meeting, I went up to them and I said, "Hey, those are really good questions. I don't have any site-specific data, but would you be interested in working together?" And it was that experience that motivated me to do a PhD that focused on three things: uptake patterns of pollutants by plants, community-engaged efforts, and participatory research. So what is participatory research? Well, it's an umbrella term. In the broadest sense, it just means engaging the general public in the research process. There's a spectrum to participatory research, but that's the general theme. Right now, what's interesting is there's around 16 different terms that have been proposed by practitioners and scholars across the field. 16 different terms that have been proposed to address environmental justice issues, and they all have a participatory research flavor. This is really exciting because it's showing us that practitioners and scholars alike are acknowledging that if you're trying to create solutions, you need to engage those that are closest to the challenge in that solution-generating dialogue. So, what might this process look like? Well, it starts off with partnership and trust building. Right? You meet people where they are, you listen, and you operate with cultural humility. And it's with this when you operate and listen with humility, people share. And this is where we've learned over the years that community members are very much concerned. Community members living near resource extraction and mining sites are very much concerned about their environmental quality. They want to know if they can grow food and eat it. They want to know if their children can play in the soil, and they want to know about their air quality. Once you have this understanding, you've built this street cred. You can now start to、uh, gather more information and engage other local champions or others who are people who are in leadership roles in their community. For example, a community、um, coalition leader reached out to our research program because they were concerned about the removal of a smelter stack. They were concerned that the removal of that stack would lead to soil and air quality issues in their community. I had a couple meetings with the coalition, and from there we decided to co-host a series of environmental health talks to slow the process down, to just engage other community members, have a create space to learn and talk about environmental issues, to then inform next steps and what we should be doing together. That takes us to the next step, what tends to be sample collection methodologies. I love this step because it's all about capacity building. This is where we're training community members on how to properly collect soil, water, plant, and dust samples. This is where once they're trained, right? They've been trained in field work, just like we learn at Research One universities. They're taking their training and they're going out and deciding where to collect soil samples. They're deciding what plants or、uh, plant or vegetable samples to collect based on their consumption pattern and cultural practice. And then they're doing this type of work at their home garden, community gardens. Maybe they're at preschools or at a high school. Now we get into one of my favorite steps, which is all about the data sharing process, because we just collected a good amount of data. And in some cases, these are samples that are sent to the lab. In other cases, community members have their own kit, and they get to do the whole analysis on their own. Regardless of the way they're collecting data, we have a lot of it. And so this is where we need to think about that data sharing process. And so we could create a 50-page technical report filled with jargon, right? No, we don't want to do that. Right? We want to be able to answer that original question, but also create something that facilitates environmental decision making and action. So what's one way we can do this? Well, one way is to use art. So I'm a scientist, but I'm also an artist. I, though I have a PhD now in soil, water, and environmental science with a minor in art, my undergraduate career was a struggle. Like I, this, I struggled. <laughs> like, and I remember coming home and telling my older brother, and I was like, "I'm done with the science degree, bro. I'm done." And he was like, "Monica, estás loca, right? You're crazy." And he threw the course catalog at me. Right back in the day, it was a hard copy. And I remember catching this thing, and he's like, "Just circle science classes that you like. Just circle ones you like." 
And I was like, all right, all right, dude, let's do this. So I circled the classes. And I was like, sure enough, I may be an artist, but I'm also a scientist too. Because I was originally molecular and cellular biology. I was like looking under a microscope, but I'm somebody who likes to look at systems and the interconnectedness of ecosystem services, human health and well-being. And so I did a ecology and evolutionary biology degree, a studio art degree, and a minor in Spanish, because if you already speak the language, you might as well just get the minor. But why am I telling you all of this? Because this is how we design the instructional manuals on how to collect the samples. This is how we design the report back materials and your result booklets. Not only are we designing it, but we're co-designing it. We're doing participatory design work here where we have community champions and community, um, community scientists part of the design process. What visualizations work, which visualizations don't work. All right, we found one that works, let's run with it. Now we host community gatherings and data sharing events. This is where we break bread, or in this case, break tacos, and we talk and we eat and we talk, like, ask new questions of the data set. We're building a culture. People are developing relationships with science in a new way. But what's interesting in this space is that that data point, that contaminant data point, ends up unleashing this history, this individual's history of what it was like living and working in that area. And that history is equally as important as that contaminant data point. And so now you have an understanding of the data and the contaminant and the lived experience. <laughs> so a lot goes on in data sharing events. A lot goes on in that space. So now we think about how do we translate this data into action? Well, what is, let's, let me give you some examples. In one community, we revealed that the local water utility was serving water that was exceeding the arsenic drinking water set under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Across communities, we've been able to document that community members and community scientists are successfully interpreting their data sets and informing their decision making. In this case, they're modifying, they're recalculating exposures and modifying their behavior to reduce, in this case, their soil ingestion. And the reason why I bring this up is when I started out this work, someone was like, you're doing work in gardens with talking about contaminants and vegetables? Monica, you better not have people stop eating their vegetables. And I was like, what? Why are you saying that? Like, it was so weird. Like, I was like, why are you telling me that? But I realized that that person didn't think that the community scientists could interpret the data. And so I'm here to tell you that they can interpret it, and they did interpret it successfully. On top of that, in 2021, this work has been received attention from this uh, scientific enterprise. And it was a paper, a National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences paper of the year, one out of 3,942 papers. This manuscript, this publication, on a co-generated data set with a community champion as a co-author who collaborated with scientists across disciplines had received this level of attention. So not only does this process, so actually, let me just highlight that yes, this process works, right? It's leading to innovation and ingenuity. It's getting recognized, but the beauty is that it was a co-generated data set, participatory design, participatory research, and we're advancing our understanding of the science, in this case, the role of plants as low-cost air pollution monitors. And if that hasn't motivated you enough to see that this building capacity effort is worthwhile, let me tell you a about a conversation with a community member who was talking about, like, I was doing this study at my home and then getting these types of results. And if I had any preconceptions or pre uh, preconceptions, perceptions differently than what this report tells me, what my booklet tells me, I have to reconsider and say, well, these are the facts. To hear a community scientist talk this way about their data right now was incredible. We're living in a time where science is being contested, data sets aren't being trusted, so this was an incredible observation because we're seeing the mental maps of these individuals change. Their environmental health mental maps are changing as a result of the participatory process and the data sharing experience. Furthermore, we asked part we, participants were reporting that they were better able to interpret pandemic data as a result of the participatory process and their data sharing experience. 
Let's go back to that zip code challenge. Have you ever looked up any of the possible dangers in your zip code? Have you looked at toxic release inventory, super fun sites where you live? There's even a social vulnerability index that you can refer to. If you have concerns, know that we can do something, and we can do something together, because we're all scientists. Challenging and changing systems are going to, it can be challenging. <laughs> I know. I remember before I started my academic career, I was told not to do participatory research. I was told that it might not carry as much weight as traditional laboratory work. Essentially, I was told that it wouldn't be valued by the institution. But today, I'm on a short list, and that short list <laughs> resides with industry and government agencies who are keeping an eye on me. And you know why? Because we're making more work for them. Because community champions and scientists are now armed with their data set to fight technical elitism. We're challenging the status quo, and we're striving for justice and change. So in this work, I'm now a cultural knowledge broker, bridging and creating trust across cultures and translating data. In this work, I'm in the middle, and in the middle, I'm here to tell you that if you want to do something, I invite you to participate. <laughs>